it's uh, still Tisha B'Av in the United States, so I'm just going to say um, welcome. Uh, I would like to share my screen with you, and we're going to get started. So uh, this, this talk, Ten Li'avne V'chachameha, the four words that saved Am Yisrael, is going to be um, basically an overview of the importance of uh, Yavne uh, specifically, but more generally, the impact of the actions of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai and the Jewish leadership at a time of immense crisis and how that uh, saved Am Yisrael and how that formed the way we look at ourselves as a nation without a temple, without a Bet HaMikdash. So without further ado, I'm going to get straight into it. So this image you may recognize is the Arch of Titus in color, uh, which is based on a 20, 2012 a, a study by Yeshiva University who assumed that there were colors because of the known colors in the Greco-Roman world, and they actually discovered this to be correct. They found the yellow of the Menorah. There's a lot of reconstruction. There's a lot going on here. I'm not going to get so much into that detail, but it's just as a background to put us into an image that we're familiar with, with the fast. So let's just take a look at what we're about to do. Okay, so in these uh, 25 minutes, there's uh, Hashem, hopefully we're going to manage to do all this. Uh, Basically, what was the story with Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai, Jerusalem, Eve of the Destruction, what was going on, right? The five W's, who, what, when, where, and how. Um, the exiles of the Sanhedrin, the move to Yavne in its broader context and things about that, that have to do with Israeli uh, society today. Uh, the importance of Yavne for Am Yisrael, we're going to talk about what Yavne did and things like that, as well as why it's such an important event. Um, and finally, Ben and Jerry's and Tel Yavne. And that has, that's a little surprise for the end. And that's going to be our concluding remarks. So let's get into the story. Uh, this is a very famous picture, which is uh, based on uh, Eyal Miron, who is the advisor to the Megalim Institute of City of David. They've been doing a lot of uh, Second Temple destruction videos. You can see a lot of their stuff online. If you have any questions about that, you can contact me later. Uh, I'm happy to send you videos, but they've been surfacing. Uh, that's like a 14-minute video in Hebrew and in English about how the uh, the rebellion and, and the war progressed until the destruction of the temple and a discussion about, you know, uh, the different sources that talk about it. But in any event, uh, so what we need to know about the story and historically is in the year 66, the Great Rebellion began after several years of mishandling the delicate situation with the Jews and the pagans and all of these Roman procurators who really extorted the people too much. It was, a, it was about to explode for a while and it finally exploded uh, with a few events that just pushed us too far. And so the revolt began. And this is known in, in Roman history as the great Jewish Roman wars. This is one of two. The other one being Bar Kokhva, which I'm gonna actually talk about at five o'clock of the next class with the JCC of Manhattan, if you're, you, know, you wanna find out about that. So uh, Emperor Nero is the last of four emperors in what was known as the year of the four emperors. And the Emperor Nero died. and while the siege was basically happening, and Vespasian, who was the commander of the 10th Legion, uh, Fratensis, was called to Rome to assume the, the position of emperor, and he left his son Titus in charge. And his son Titus, of course, later became the emperor. Now, that's going to be very important in terms of determining at what stage of the uh, siege and the rebellion did the story happen. So let's get into the story. Um, I want to first introduce our characters. So a little bit about Vespasian, because it's going to be important. This is our dear uh, Aspasianos or Vespasian, as he is called in, in Chazal, Aspasianos, which is his Greek name. Here, I mean, I mean his Roman name, as opposed to the English. And this is one of his coins, which says Vespasian on it. So this is Vespasian. And I want to show you a few places in the old city where you can actually see uh, the imprint of the... Of the um, 10th Legion. So one of the things that Vespasian did as an introduction, he built the Colosseum, the first three of several tiers of the Colosseum. There's a dedication plaque which proves that uh, this was an article by Louis Feldman in the Bar Review, Biblical Archaeology Review, less than 10 years, 10 years ago, where they were able to prove that it was built from the spoils of war from Jerusalem, right? And it was a place where, uh, where the the Jewish slaves as well were used as entertainment to fight each other to the death and fight wild animals. So we all know the Arch of Titus as well, also built to commemorate this. So it's a, ma it's a very, very important event. And after the destruction, and, I mean, since before that actually, the 10th Legion, Legio X Fratensis, X is Roman numeral 10, 
were stationed in Jerusalem for several centuries, uh, which is going to be important for some other details about the old city. So here is, for example, a stone from a military base. Now look carefully at what it says, because this is going to be important later. This is a standard stone. The Roman, Roman soldiers served even in times of peace as builders. They built the Roman roads, as we know. They built a lot of different things. They built clay uh, shingles for rooftops, but that's after the destruction already. It says on top, L-E-G, short for legion, legio. X is Roman numeral 10, and F-R-E is short for fratensis. That was the name of the legion. And on the bottom, it says C-O-H, short for cohort, I-I-X, Roman numeral eight. So this is the eighth cohort of the 10th legion, ruled by Vespasian and several generals after him for several uh, centuries. And they built a lot of things in Jerusalem. So these are common in Jerusalem. So we all know this wall. This is the wall built by Suleiman the Magnificent around uh, less than 500 years ago. But he built it on top of Roman wall foundations, second temple walls, Herodian stones, and they reused material that was available in Jerusalem. And they did actually find stones from Roman base camps. And so they used those stones as part of the walls. Now, um, a little bit further on, around the area of the first palm tree, facing that palm tree in the wall is this stone. Look carefully at it and see if you notice what I'm talking about. Let me make that easier for you. That is the remainder of a Legio ex Fratensis stone from, the Roman, from a Roman camp of some sort, right? And there are several of these in the walls and in other places in Jerusalem. A little bit of a, a taste of the impact that this legion had on the region. So that's to give you a little bit about who was Aspasianos, who was the person who we're about to encounter. So let's get to, into our story. Our story is in the context of the very famous Gemara in Gitin, uh, which talks about Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, Tarnagol and Tarnagolta and Shurumalka, all those stories where people made silly decisions which had a tremendously devastating consequence on our history. And within that context, we have this story. Abba Sikra was Reish Birune de Yerushalayim. The, I'm going to basically paraphrase this, but we have the, uh, the several different groups, as, as Josephus mentions, five different groups, of Jews who are inside Jerusalem, who are fighting each other for different religious and ideological reasons, political reasons. And Abba Sikra, which Sikra the Sikari, the, the, which Josephus calls Sikari, the people who had swords, Sikari, would go and, and stab their political opponents, create a lot of mayhem, and then blend into the crowd. They would kill their political opponents. These people were not letting anybody talk about even negotiating with the Romans. The Romans are the devil. We have to kill them. We have to fight them. And if you dare dispute us, you will f find yourself dead. So it was a very, very bad situation, as we know. We talk about Sinat Chinam, about the nonsense hatred between different groups. And by the time we figured out that we could maybe stand a chance against the, Ro the Romans, if we get along, it was too late. Um, part, one of these groups burnt the, store, the, the grain houses, the food storehouses, which would have allowed us to endure perhaps a little longer and maybe collect our energy. So it was pretty bad. And one of the leaders of the Sikari was, there's a discussion about who he was, uh, he was the uh, nephew of Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai, who's the student of Shilel and Shammai. He was a very notable Talmud Chacham. And he sent him uh, quietly a message saying, listen, you're going to kill everybody by, by starvation. We have to find a solution. We have to find, this is not the way. So in long story short, he said, listen, I agree with you, but my people will kill me. We, we can't pull this off. We have to find a way. So he said, let's devise a plan to allow you to go and speak to the Romans, which is Vespasian, the 10th legion, who are outside of Jerusalem at the beginning of the siege. So he, he plays sick. Everybody knows Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai is sick. And of course, nobody gets buried inside Yerushalayim. So the goons, the Sikari, who, uh, the zealots who were protecting the way in and out would allow people to go out to be buried. Of course, when they came to the door and he's being carried with Rabbi Eliezer ben Araf and Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananiah, he's being carried by his students. They, Let's just poke him with a sword to make sure he's dead. And they say, and his nephew is like, God forbid you should defile the body of a Talmud Chacham. So let's just uh, uh, throw him on the floor and see how he reacts. God forbid people are going to talk about how you, you treat a Talmud Chacham who's dead. Fine. They pull him out and he's able to go and he meets... Uh, he meets Vespasian. 
So he comes to Vespasian and he says to him, Shalama alach malka, shalama alach malka. Greetings, your majesty. And Vespasian said to him, you have just earned yourself the double death sentence. Number one, you, you are saying I'm a king. I am not a king. And you have, uh, that's called treason. And you should be killed for calling me your highness. And the second thing is, if you are saying I am king, then why did it take you so long to come and speak to me? I mean, imagine just the anguish involved in getting, uh, in mobilizing the army from different parts of the empire to bring them here. You just cost us billions of dollars, right? So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai said, first of all, the fact that I called you uh, a king, uh, well, you must be a king, because otherwise Yerushalayim will not be handed into your hand. And if you've been following the most recent podcast I was doing on Tanakh study, I spoke about the Lebanon as a metaphor for Bet HaMikdash. He says, Lebanon be'adir yipol. It will only fall in the hands of an Adir. And he points out that an Adir, a great person, must be a king. And Lebanon is Bet HaMikdash, as it says, which we learned in, in Vayat Hanan. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ha'har hatov hazeh ve'ha Lebanon. I want to see Eretz Yisrael the Lebanon, right? Referring to, like, as a metaphor for Bet HaMikdash. And they, they go back and forth in discussing uh, like, why do you have to kill the city if there's all these, it's just these zealots. So he's saying, well, if you have a snake, a serpent surrounding a barrel of wine and you want to get to the wine, you have to kill the snake. So it's, it's a done deal. You cannot save Jerusalem. And that's pretty much what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai understood. And the fact, he says, that you said that I haven't come until now at this point, that's because there's these zealots who aren't letting me out. So that's the conversation you're having. Now, remember I said it's the year of the four emperors. Nero just died. And a messenger comes from Rome saying, you have to come, uh, you have to come to Rome, you are the king, right? He hears this, he's completely impressed by Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, and he says, um, I'm going to go to Rome now, and he leaves his son Titus to continue the siege and to break into the city and destroy it. And, but I want to help you from there, but what, ask me something that I can fulfill now that I'm here. And he said these famous four words. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai says to Vespasian, Tenli Yavne Bachameha. Give me Yavne and its sages. He asks for, for two, uh, two more things. He asks for Shoshilta de Rabban Gamliel, preserve the dynasty of Rabban Gamliel, who comes from David Hamelech. We need them. He, he's the Nasi. And Asvata de Mesayenle de Rabbi Tzadok. Rabbi Tzadok was one of the Tzadikim of Yerushalayim who was so emaciated from starving and praying for Yerushalayim. We need to save him and we need the best doctors. We need the empire's doctors, right? So those are the three things that he did to establish the continuity of Am Yisrael. Now, the assumption is that Yavne, which is a port city, the assumption is that the Sanhedrin were already in Yavne at the time, not that he's saying, let's go to some random place, let's pick Yavne. They were there already. That's the assumption. We don't have the time to get into too much of this the conversation. So let's go to uh, the story of Yavne. So... The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah discusses that there were 10 exiles that the Shekhinah, the presence of the divine connection and love for Am Yisrael, uh, gradually moved and moved away. At first it was between the Keruvim and then it moved out and out. At a certain point, it was sort of like there's this le- lack of connection. And just in the same way that the Shekhinah was exiled 10 times, so too were the Sanhedrin, which were the body of leadership, of, of unity, in the leadership of Am Yisrael. And it talks about these 10 different travels of the Sanhedrin. There's different versions, but I'm just going over one of them. And here's the map on the right. So several places in Yerushalayim, Mishkat Agazit Techanut, from from the stone of Hewn Rock, which by the way, uh, capital punishment, killing a person for an offense was only allowed when the the, the when the Sanhedrin are sitting in the, the chamber of Hun Rock of Lishkat HaGazit in, on the Temple Mount. And it's at a certain point where they realize that the value of human life is so low that capital punishment will not have an impact. And therefore they removed themselves because we cannot afford to have that much power when the, the community, the society is not there. So we were going to remove ourselves so that we don't have that kind of power, which is a remarkable thing, right? Why not just double down on it so people get the point? They're not getting the point, right? From Yitichanut into the city of Yerushalayim, and here is we have Yerushalayim to Yavne. So they're already in Yavne, and then there's a few travels, Yavne to Usha, Usha to Yavne, uh, and then again, Yavne to Usha, Usha Shfaram, Shfaram to Beit Sharim, Beit Sharim to Tzipori, and Tzipori to Tveria. So the last days of the Sanhedrin are pretty much in the north, in the Galilee. 
which is after the, after the Great War, there were less and less Jews allowed to even be around Yerushalayim. It was a safer place to be. In terms of the Roman administration, it was also a different district. Like it, the Galilee wasn't necessarily part of the war unless they got involved, which of course they did later. But, so, so in the recent years, uh, there's been a resurgence of interest of the Sanhedrin trail. There's actually a series of lectures every week with a WhatsApp group of experts talking about different discoveries along the Sanhedrin trail. So it's fascinating how this is becoming part of, it's back in the Israeli conversation. So let's get into the person, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, and then we're going to go and see a few things about Yavne and their importance. Now, there was a gift of the British government in 1956 to the Israeli government. It's a big menorah with some 60 or 70 images of Jewish history on this menorah. Uh, I recommend looking it up. Uh, I can't go into so much detail, but this is one of the pictures on the menorah, which is Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. And if you look carefully at what's happening, he is spreading his arms out to the heaven and watching the collapse of Yerushalayim. And there's the scholars on the bottom and he saved scholarship, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So just before we get into it, a fun story from the neighborhood. This is Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai's synagogue, which was restored after 1967 when the Jordanians tried to destroy it and other synagogues. This is, my, this is one of the synagogues I pray in regularly uh, in, in the old city, Rabbi Eliyahu Medina, may he live long, is the, rab, the chief Sephardic rabbi of the old city, and this is his show. So that's the Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai synagogue right by the parking lot. So Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai was known for his, his, his insistence on scholarship, on knowing Torah, so that the lay people will know Torah. Think about it, if somebody says, um, Torah says that, what does Torah say? Where does it say it? How about if I say, uh, science says, what, what does science say? What physics, what publication? Get specific, mastery of information. What Rabbi Yochanan Zakai wanted is people to have mastery of Torah, not just Torah, to know, is it a Mishnah, is it a Gemara, is it a Pasuk? No Torah, no, not just that Torah should be not relegated to the realm of the scholars, but rather that everybody should be proficient and know Torah. So one of the, one of the many things that about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, this is from Masechet Sofrim, which is all about scribes and writing Sifrei Torah, that he said, Lo hiniach parasha achat min ha-Torah shelo lemada, velimed bemikra v'targum, midrash, halachot v'adadot, umishalot. He learned every single part of Torah with its reading, with its translation, midrash, exegetical learnings, halachot, agadot, everything. He mastered everything. And he learned, he says, they said about him that he would say if the entire heaven were, were, was leathering, you kol ha-shamayim yiriot, v'kol ha-ilanot kul musim, and all of the trees were, were, uh, pens for writing, and all of the oceans were ink. There's not enough to talk about what I learned from my rabbis. It's like if a fly would dip into the ocean and, and get a little bit wet, that's how much I was able to convey from what I've learned from my rabbis. They were so great. So let's get into, in our last 10 minutes, let's get into some stories. So a few of the institutions of Yavne, the Takanot of Yavne, which are very important. Uh, Yavne was basically trying to tell us how to replace the Bet HaMikdash in our daily life so that we can be a portable nation which is flexible and moving and vibrant and thriving. So prayers instead of the Korbanot three times a day. Uh, a special, the fourth blessing in Birkat Amazon, which was instituted after the Bar Kokhba War when the, when the kill, killed people of Beit were allowed to be buried. Um, seven, w waving the lulav in, in, on Sukkot, seven days, because the real halakha is that only in the Bet HaMikdash, when the temple's up, you wave the lulav seven days, but in the time of, but outside of the temple, or, or outside of Jerusalem, it depends how you learn it, only on one day. And he wanted us to commemorate Bet HaMikdash in our lives, every day we wave the lulav. And of course, um, the day of, this, the first day of Chol HaMoed Pesach, or in, in, outside of Eretz Yisrael, the second day of Yom Tov, when we start counting the Omer, you would be able to eat hadash, to eat the new grain uh, from that year after a korban would have been brought at a certain point. Now, you'd have to wait for that korban to be brought. Now, what happens with that Bet HaMikdash? So what he said is, I'm going to prohibit eating hadash the entire day. You have to wait an entire day. Why? Because if the Bet HaMikdash is built tomorrow, right, and you'll think like, wait a minute, until now I've been eating it in the morning, why not eat it on the morning of the same day? The korban wasn't brought yet. So you have that consciousness of the impact of not having a Bet HaMikdash on your daily practices. And so we wait the entire day. 
And here, standardizing the calendar, there's a famous story in Masechet Rosh Hashanah where he forces Rabbi Yeshua to come to travel to him in the day that he decided is Yom Kippur because we have to standardize the, the calendar to make sure that we have unity in Am Yisrael, right? The fact that we follow Bet Hillel and not Bet Shammai was standardized at Yavne. Uh, the fact that we follow the majority in order to avoid machloket, to avoid conflict in Am Yisrael, we need to be unified, right? We learn from our mistakes. So these are some of the important takanot in Yavne. And before I get into the last part, the, fa the famous story in Yavne, I see that my, I'm running ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just paraphrase it because my PowerPoint is acting funny. So there's a famous story of uh, there was a special kind of oven and there was an argument, is this oven, can it can ex accept tumat, is it not? Because it's segmented like a snake, like an achnai. And there's a story with Rabbi Yoshua uh, and, and Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer is basically saying, halacha is like me. And they say to him, no, it's not. We are not convinced that the halacha is like us. And he says, well, if the halacha is like me, uh, this palm tree will prove it. And the palm tree gets lifted miraculously and goes 100 yards away. Like, well, you can't prove anything from a palm tree. Okay, well, this river is going to prove it. And the river flows the opposite direction. And they go, I'm sorry, the river ain't proven nothing. We are not convinced by your logic. And he goes, well, if I am right, then, then the walls of the Beit Midrash will collapse. And the walls start collapsing. And they say like, and the walls did not collapse because of the merit of the Hachamim who were there, but it didn't go back because of his merit. So it's this weird story of the walls that, that, that remain suspended, sort of. I'll get to that later. And finally, he said, if I am, if the halacha is like me, they will prove it from Shamayim. They will prove it. And a bat kol, a heavenly voice came out and said, he's right. And Rabbi Yoshua gets up and he said, lo bashamayim he. You stay out of it up there. What does that mean? Because we, we, don't, we don't care what they tell us in Shamayim. Torah was given to us, and we have the rules of how to decide Torah, and we have to decide it here on earth. And so they didn't accept the halacha like him. And this is a very, very famous Yavne story. Now, the reason this is so important, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really wrap this up. We have less than five minutes. So uh, there is a foundation stone, which is my father's organization in 2003, 4, 5, uh, decided we want to find out where is the actual Yavne, let's find the Bet Midrash, let's get, in, get involved Israeli society in digging here and learning the story through digging here. And so this is part of the excavation. Now this, this is a, a tower, they call it the Tooth, the Bay Bar, Bars Tower, just a few pictures. That's my father and his partner on the left, David Wilner, Foundation Stone, they, they ran the dig. And the sponsors for the dig were Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So with all the talk about Ben and Jerry's and anti-Semitism, I'll just say that the CEO of Ben and Jerry's is very pro-Israel and he's the one who, who, who helped sponsor this because of how much he cares, right? And so this is a little bit of a brochure that they put together about this excavation. Now this excavation used technology from geology, from, from mining, which was never used in an archeological site before, this is a prototype, where it's called ground rating, penetrating radar, where it goes down in the ground, and I actually helped drag this machine around, and it gives you a slice of what's underneath, so you know what to dig before you dig it. Cool, right? And so I wanna show you some pictures from there. So here's pictures from the excavation. Um, some of you have uh, been on the SCA talk with my brother. So this person here with the long hair and the earrings, that's the same guy. Uh, that's my brother, so believe it or not. Uh, we all, I was all in the dig, I just couldn't find the picture. More pictures of people on the dig. Kids coming from the neighborhood with the Yavne shirt. And tell Yavne was used for, these kids who knew nothing about Yavne, one of the most important uh, stories in our history, knew nothing about it. The next day they came with their parents, unaffiliated, all kinds of Jews, and told their parents about it and they participated in the dig. That's part of the power of an archeological dig. So I'm gonna wrap up with some stories about what, what exactly is this, is this about. So these are some pictures from Yavne. The impact that Yavne had on our this demand for excellence and continuity through learning Torah and commitment to learning Torah and the focus on Jewish education has set a path for the way Am Yisrael has behaved throughout history. We come to a new place, we build a mikvah and a school, right? So that we can function and we can have education, right? That's part of the, the responsibility as a community that we have, which Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai set. And that is why every single, like, Almost any school in the world will be called Yavne. Yavne is the most famous name for a Jewish institution all over the world. 
because of this connection to Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, ten liyav nebachachameha. It's those four words which saved Am Yisrael, which allowed us to, to, to be portable and flexible and to survive through Torah and through education. And that's what really set the stage for the success of Am Yisrael until this day. And so that is ten liyav nebachachameha. And, and as my uncle Rabbi David Cohen in Brooklyn says, it's yibane, it will be built. Because if we do this, then Be'ezrat Hashem, we will be built and we will come back to building our nation. So that was a really fast 100 mile per hour, but I, we managed to do that. That is our story of Yavne and the four words that changed Amisayim.